Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom, and I'm honored to serve as the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's senior minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all you're bringing with you today and all your heart longs to set down. I especially want to welcome you into our worship service this morning by inviting you to repeat First Church's mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Our opening words this morning are a poem called For Morning Anxiety by Meta Herrick Carlson. For Morning Anxiety. Don't get up quite yet. First blink and breathe and believe you are fiercely loved. Do not be fooled by the list that hunts you down each dawn. You are called to a few things, not all the things. Be still until you hear the sacred silence whisper underneath the hustle and the bundle of nerves that thing you are desperate to earn has already been declared. And then rise like the sun, one shade of sky at a time. Let's go now to our beloved sanctuary where we'll light the chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. My name is Reverend Kimberly Tomchek Carlson, and it is my honor to serve as the Minister of Religious Education at First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. The story I have for you today is called The Other Way to Listen. It's by Bird Baylor and Peter Parnell. I used to know an old man who could walk by any cornfield and hear the corn singing. Teach me, I'd say, when we passed on by. I never said a word while he was listening. Just tell me how you learned to hear that corn. And he'd say, it takes a lot of practice. You can't be in a hurry. And I'd say, I have the time. He was so good at listening once he heard wildflower seeds burst open, beginning to grow underground. That's hard to do. He said he was just lucky to have been by himself up there in the canyon after a rain. He said it was the quietest place he'd ever been, and he'd stayed there long enough to understand the quiet. I said, I bet you were surprised when you heard those seeds. But he said, no, I wasn't surprised at all. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world. And then he just smiled, remembering. Another time, he heard a rock kind of murmur good things to a lizard. I was there. We saw the lizard sunning on the rock. Of course, we stopped. The old man said, I wonder how that lizard feels about the rock it's sitting on. And I wonder how the rock feels about the lizard. He always liked to ask himself hard questions, ones that take a while to answer. We leaned against another rock, a long time passed, and then he said, did you hear that? They like each other. I said, I didn't hear anything. He said, "Something. sometimes everything being right kind of makes a sound. Just like now, it wasn't much more than a good feeling that I heard from that old rock. Were you surprised to hear it, I asked. No, not a bit, he said. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world. I said, 
I wish I had heard it too. And he said he thought that I might someday. Most people never hear those things at all. I said, I wonder why. He said, they just don't take the time you need for something that important. I said, I'll take the time, but you have to teach me first. I'd like to if I could, he said, but the thing is, you have to learn it from the hills and ants and lizards and weeds and things like that. They do the teaching around here. Just give me a clue on how to start, I said. And so he said, do this. Go get to know one thing as well as you can. It should be something small. Don't start with the mountain. Don't start with the whole Pacific Ocean. Start with one seed pod or one dry weed or one horned toad or one handful of dirt or one sandy wash. I said, I'll take the sandy wash. And he said he started with one tree. Every morning of his life, when he was young, he climbed a cottonwood and sat there listening. He told me it was worth the time. He said that trees were very honest and they don't care much for fancy people. He said he doesn't know of anything he ever did as important as sitting in that tree. Tell me everything you can, I said. He said, well, you have to respect the tree or hill or whatever it is with, that you're with. And don't be ashamed to learn things from bugs or sand or anything. And I said, I won't. He thought of one more thing. It's good to walk with people, but sometimes go alone. That way, he said, you can always stop and listen at the right time. I'll remember everything I said, and I did. But nothing worked. I thought there must be something wrong with me because I only heard the wind and the quail and the coyotes and the doves and things that anyone could hear. I almost gave up trying. Of course, I still went walking in my hills. In fact, I used to sing to them a lot. I thought since they wouldn't sing to me, I'd just sing to them instead. The day I'm telling you about now, I was singing. The whole song was this, hello hills, hello hills, hello hills. That was after I'd been away five days and I'd missed those hills, five days. I went out earlier than usual. You know how everything looks new at sunrise? Well, all those hills were looking new. And I was just walking where I always walk. But that morning, I kept thinking to myself, here I am. And whatever way I happened to go was always right. I climbed the rocky side, not the path. The rocky side is steeper, but I like it best. And anyway, that's where I found my three hawk feathers. I stood up at the top where I always stand, looking down. Hello, hills. Hello, hills. Hello, hills. All I know is suddenly I wasn't the only one singing. The hills were singing too. I stopped. I didn't move for maybe an hour. I never listened so hard, hard in my life. Of course, their kind of singing isn't loud. It isn't any sound you can explain. It isn't made with words. You couldn't write it down. All I can say is that it came straight up from those dark, shiny lava rocks humming. It moved around like wind. It seemed to be the oldest sound in the world. All I can say is I was standing in the middle of that sound at seven o'clock in the morning, just thinking, here I am, and thinking, listen and not even being surprised. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world. The end.
Mm, thank you so much, Kimberly. We're going to enter a time of meditation now, followed by silence, followed by spirit of life. So go ahead and just take a minute and feel your body. Feel where you are right now. Maybe that means feeling your feet pressing into the floor, or maybe it means feeling your sit bones pressing into the seat you're in. Maybe it means feeling your breath moving in and out of your lungs. Whatever it is, let it bring you into being here and now. Spirit of life and love, Holy One of our being and our becoming, that which is sacred within, among and beyond us. Come be with us this morning as we are here in our anticipation or maybe anxiety or maybe excitement about all the change that's happening and that's coming. Changing seasons, the transition of changing elections. In all that energy, let us ground in what is right now. Ground in our bodies, ground in our senses, ground in our breath, in our life. Help us settle, feeling where we are right now and stretching all our senses, listening or seeing or touching, tasting, smelling. Let us use what we have right now to expand our attention, reaching out, noticing, all that's around us, listening deeply with our whole body to all that is. We are here, now, in this place, beloved and deeply worthy. In all the change and transition and everything that's coming that might throw us let us return to this ground and remember, here, now, alive, beloved. May it be so, and amen.
Good morning and welcome. My name is Kevin Gibson and I'm happy to be your worship associate today. I met the Numinous on a hill in 1976 and it changed my life for the better. We live in turbulent and troubling times, but what I encountered there allows me to find a peaceful centre and draw strength in the face of distress and uncertainty. In 1976, I was serving with the British Army, attached to the Allied Command Europe mobile force, and our task was to rapidly deploy if there were threats to NATO in the event of an attack by the Soviet Union, as it was then. At the time, there were debates about the best way to deal with the Soviets. Some believed that they would be deterred by Western strength, while others felt the only sensible approach was for each side to somehow ratchet down the risks. In the 70s and 80s, the prevailing strategy went by the almost ironic acronym MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. So if one side initiated a strike, then there would be no stopping a nuclear holocaust. As the astronomer Carl Sagan described it, imagine a room awash in gasoline, and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches, the other 7,000 matches. Each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. February of that year found me on sentry duty at three in the morning in the remote Norwegian countryside near the Swedish border, taking part in war games. The outline was that Redland was about to attack Orangeland and we were the Blue Land forces tasked to deter and resist any incursion. As you might imagine, the whole scene had a whiff of the surreal. Our small force practicing basic infantry tactics contrasted wildly with the reality of the nuclear horrors that could happen if either side felt it was losing a land war. It was bitterly cold and lying in the snow trying not to make a sound felt much more like a game than war. With my colleagues asleep, I was the only one conscious and aware of our surroundings. I looked up at the sky, as I had often done before, but this time when I did, I realised that I was privileged in a way few people are lit, uh, today are. I was in the pristine snowscape with no artificial light and no background sounds. The silence was palpable, and any movement, including my breathing, seemed to disturb the stillness. The stars sparkled in the vast overarching sky. I encountered what philosophers are called the numinous, an experience of meeting the mystical, a connection with the natural world that evokes awe, wonder, a feeling of overpowering force of nature that at once made me feel both small and inconsequential, but at the same time special, fortunate to be given a glimpse into a world and a universe that few modern people would ever know. I was confronted with the beauty, the aesthetic of nature, an abrupt awakening from the anaesthetic of immediacy. And for the first time, I experienced wonder and respect for the mystical. I was 20 years old. The world didn't make much sense and I didn't know where I fit in. War games seemed both important and absurd at the same time. We knew we could be annihilated in an instant along with every living creature. But nevertheless, we took the military exercises seriously. I was part of an institutional machine that advocated both peace and violence at the same breath. At that point, I didn't know how to deal with the evident paradoxes around me. I was also at a crossroads in the absence of faith or trust in the answers of established religious dogma. I was at sea in my relationship to the universe. But in that one wakening moment, I was able to find a connection that made me feel I was not alone, but part of something greater. It was a rare and passing moment, but the insight left me with a feeling that had helped me over time when confronting the absurd, the wild and unsettled times in my life. Our small troop probably didn't bring down the Soviet menace, and we still live in troubled times. Blue against red, nuclear weaponry has proliferated, and our politicians readily default to confrontation and militarization. Yet one legacy of that moment is that improbably dramatic tension can lead to spiritual resolution. It seems to me that the noise of the world can sometimes still 
into the signal of the mystical, if we can be open to it. That we can find connection despite the forces pulling us apart and discover presence when we feel alone. My time in Norway was a lasting gift, one that changed me and gave resonance to the words of the English poet William Blake. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. There is another world, but it is in this one. There is another world, but it is in this one. Come walk with me on our saints' day. Green in shades of touch. Green a kiss, green in shades a touch, green in light a kiss, oh come walk with me on All Saints Day. you for that beautiful beautiful music and that story when i was a young adult a close friend of mine told me about an afternoon she had spent talking to the trees i listened to her and i smiled and nodded along but i had no idea what she was talking about 20 years later now after having read The Secret Life of Trees and The Overstory, and 10 years into my daily meditation practice in which I practice deep and wide listening, I'm starting to think that listening to trees is possible. The short National Geographic film called Being Here directed by Matthew Mickelson and Palmer Morse, follows acoustic ecologist Gordon Hempton as he records natural soundscapes, something that he's been doing for 35 years. Acoustic ecology studies the relationship between human beings and their environment through sound. It asks, how does sound affect us? And how do we affect the world through sound? Gordon Hempton found his call into the world of exploring sound through a transformative moment he had with the numinous when he was 27 years old. In an interview with the New York Times, he said that that moment happened when he was on one of those road trips between your old life and your new one. I pulled over to get some rest, 
he said. And as I lay on the ground, I watched a storm develop. And I remember hearing the thunder define the far reaches of the valley as the storm passed over me, drenching me. This was the first time I experienced true listening. Hempton calls true listening, listening fully, widely and broadly to all that is his worship experience. He thinks of that night when he was 27 years old and drenched by the rain that he fully listened for the first time, his baptism. Hempton is very tuned in to sound and he's been sharpening his sense of hearing over 35 years. But when I think about listening, I don't only think of the physical sense of literal hearing. I think of listening as paying attention and the different kinds and ranges of senses that we can use to pay attention. Hearing is one of them. There's also sight and touch and taste and smell. The senses, they can connect us to a place in nuanced and complex and layering ways that shift over lifetimes. In fact, Hempton himself has had two bouts of hearing loss in the last decade, and he's had to grapple with his relationship to sound and how it affects his environment in the context of his own journey. Deep listening means that we can listen with our whole body attuning to a place and time with all the different ways our senses can, can reach out. In an interview with the New York Times in its 2019 Sanctuaries of Silence series, Hempton said that we can find the sound of a place paradoxically through silence. We can find the sound of a place through silence. Silence, Hempton said, is the poetics of space. It is what it means to be in a place. In his work with, with sound, soundscapes, Hempton scapes the fascinating relationship between sound and silence. His life is dedicated to both sound and silence. And he pushes the conventional understanding of what silence and sound are. He says, silence isn't the absence of something, but rather the presence of everything. Silence is the presence of time undisturbed. It can be felt, felt in the chest. It nurtures our human nature. In the 2017 book, Silence in the Age of Noise, Norwegian explorer Erling Kagi celebrates the sound of silence. Kegi is the first person ever to finish hiking what's called the Three Poles Challenge, hiking to the North Pole, the South Pole, and the summit of Mount Everest. In the book, Kegi mines his experience hiking to the South Pole alone for 50 days in freezing silence and snow to explore the questions, what is silence? Where can it be found? 
And why is it more important now than ever? In that Antarctic journey to the South Pole, Kegi hiked in silence, wrapped in solitude. When the plane that flew him to the edge of his Antarctic journey left him, he promptly removed the batteries from the radio that they required him to bring for safety, and he threw the batteries away. After that, he began his nearly two-month hike through potentially fatal freezing winds, ice, and snow, alone, in total silence. In the book, Keggy wrote, each time I stopped for a break, if the wind was not blowing, I experienced an overwhelming silence. When there is no wind, even the snow looks silent. And now for me, here's where it gets interesting where that relationship between sound and silence starts to crack open and reveal itself. Kegi continued, in that silence, I became more and more attentive to the world of which I was a part. With no one to talk to, I began a conversation with nature. My thoughts were broadcast to the mountains and other ideas were sent back. The dance between sound and silence mirrors the soul's dance between self and other. Inner silence dances with outer noise and outer silence dances with inner noise. Kegi found that in the silence of his Antarctic journey, there was nowhere to hide from his inner noise. He wrote, I was forced to ponder my thoughts and what's worse, my feelings. In utter silence, the noise of the mind must be confronted. In daily life, usually the noise of human beings, of the city and the people and the cars and the cell phones and the televisions and the blinking nights, whether that noise is literal or figurative, just the busyness takes us out of the inner life, distracts us from the utter cacophony of our own minds and relieves us of the pressures of what it is that truly weighs on our hearts. But in silence, there is no escape, no distraction, no shiny object or ringing bell to take the mind away from the stunning crush of the inner landscape. In silence, in solitude, we must confront ourselves. Paradoxically, the absence of human-made sounds gives us access to a fullness of life that can also take us out of ourselves. In that New York Times interview, Hempton said, when I listen, I have to be quiet. So I become very peaceful I think what I enjoy most about listening is that I disappear. I disappear. Listening deeply to silence, silence turns out not to be very silent at all. Rather, that silence is full of life to which we usually don't pay attention. The self shrinks in it as the world grows and then speaks to us. The rustle of the leaves 
telling us how many molecules of air are traveling to where. The crash of the waves, reminding us both of the big movement of wind and storm and the even bigger movement of moon and gravity. The soft scuffle of small animals telling us of an ecosystem that goes on living despite and beyond us. In the absence of human noise, the world speaks. It is a lure that can beckon us out of the twisting, turning human drama and back into the larger landscape of time and being. In silence, we disappear into the world and the world speaks to us. Silence and noise dancing together in a figure eight, disappearing into one another through listening to the whole. Acoustic ecology asks, how does sound affect us? And therefore, how does silence affect us? Keggy and Hempton add to that conversation, what is the relationship between sound and silence and inner and outer noise, both literal and figurative? In a 2016 study published in the Psychological Science Journal, neuroscientist and Harvard professor Moshe Barr showed that inner noise has a significant effect on our mental capacity for creativity and original thought. In a series of experiments, Barr and graduate student Shira Barur showed that the higher a person's mental load, the less likely they were to do creative, original thinking. For instance, in one experiment in the study, they had one group of people memorize seven digit long numbers and another group of people memorize two digit long numbers. Then with both groups, they did a basic free association exercise, showing them a series of single words and asking them what other word they would most quickly associate with the first word. Ketchup might result in the association of mustard, for instance, or maybe tomato or French fry or red. In the study, they found that the people who were trying to hold seven digits in their minds were much less original and creative in their answers than the folks holding two digits. The more mental load those in the experiment held, the more statistically common their answers were. The two digit folks, on the other hand, who were holding a lower mental load had more varied and original answers to the free association exercise. Inner noise, mental load, diminishes creativity. Now that feels intuitively true to me and not all that surprising. However, the related conclusion of the researchers that I found more exciting is its mirror. Without a taxing mental load, the natural free state of the human mind is one of creativity and originality. It's our natural mode of being. So with more mental space and freedom, you're more likely to have new and interesting thoughts. The study went further to explore how inner and outer noise are related to what Barr and Barur described as two different modes of the brain's operations, exploratory and exploitative. 
The exploitative mode is what the brain uses when it's busy or tired or needs things to be easy. You might be very familiar with the exploitative mode of the brain right now. In these situations, the brain exploits safe, tried and true brain pathways. It exploits the familiar and what it knows. You come home exhausted from a long day at work. You put the easiest thing that you have to make in the oven and you turn on the TV. Not a lot of thinking. In exploratory mode, however, the brain's focus widens. It becomes more alert and it takes more information in. Then it uses that information to make novel connections and be more creative. Both of these brain modes are necessary. There's no need to feel bad about using one or the other. But if we understand how they work and why they do what they do, we can be conscious about which one we're using if we want to go into exploratory mode, we can choose to deliberately employ different tools to do that. We could get out of our usual routine, for instance, like Kegi did when he traveled to Antarctica, or we could deliberately expand the range of our attention as Hampton does when he listens widely to all the sounds of a whole place. You can intentionally switch to exploratory mode, moving to a wider and more alert state of attention and thereby bringing in more information and making new connections. Next week, I will be one of many clergy working with the nonpartisan election defenders on election day. To prepare for November 3rd, I took an election defenders de-escalation training this past Friday night. During the training, they showed us busy images for a few seconds each, and then they asked us to recall what we saw in those images. First, they asked us generally what we remembered, and then they asked us very specific questions about details in the images to see if we could remember them. They were helping us practice noticing more broadly than we usually do. They were helping us to try to move our brains out of exploitation mode and into exploratory mode. It was an exercise in flexing the muscle of noticing and observing broadly with all of the available senses, listening with the whole body to the whole place, which requires intention. When we do it, we expand our attention out, not just into our senses, but into the world, becoming more a part of it and engaging the dance of self and other. There's a lot of pressure on this moment right now. A lot of pressure on our brains and our bodies and our spirits. We're coming up on a really important election and a lot of folks are putting a lot of energy and work into that. This is an election that we understand will at best be chaotic and confusing and at worst might include an attempt at an undemocratic power grab, what we would call a coup. It's scary to name that out loud, but in naming it, 
we give our minds and our bodies and our spirits a moment to prepare. We begin our work with spiritual preparation so that we can be grounded beacons of clarity in what will be confusing circumstances. We do the work to get ready get our language and our definitions ready. Democracy means that we have to count every vote and no one wins the election until every vote is counted. We get ready, ready to wait, knowing that counting every vote might take some time. And we make our emergency preparedness plans, even getting ready for nonviolent civil disobedience because our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to defend democracy. We are a planful people at First Church. We have a fire drill every year at church, not because we expect a fire, but because we want to have an emergency plan in case the worst happens. If you want to plan and practice with us, Kevin is going to drop into your live chat now the registration link to sign up for the civil disobedience training that our Defend Democracy team is hosting tomorrow night, October 26th from 6 to 8 p.m on Zoom. You can also find that registration link on our First Church Facebook page and group. And you can find our team's email for more information in our First Church weekly announcements that are posted every week on our website. Our Unitarian Universalist faith is committed to democracy. It's the fifth principle of seven. And in defending democracy, everyone has a role to play, including civil disobedience, but also including working from home on getting the word out or doing legal support. Just doing the work of naming what democracy is and insisting that every vote be counted. We all have a role to play. To get ready though, to get ready, to defend democracy well, we must be grounded and centered within ourselves and alert and attentive to the wide world around us. In our election defenders training, the number one step in de-escalation was centering the self followed by paying attention to the fullness of place. Your spiritual practices will serve you well right now. They will serve you well in grounding yourself and broadening your senses, listening deeply to the wholeness of now. We pair at First Church the fundamentally necessary grounding work of spiritual practice with the calling of history-changing, life-saving work in the world in the beautiful dance between inner and outer. So let's get ready. Let's broaden our view, broaden our soundscape, and pay attention to the whole that is. Not just a few people, but all the people. Not just human voices, but also the trees and the plants and the place and the echoes of generations past and future and waterfalls and bird calls and waves sloshing on the sandy beach. All of it. The whole. All that is. And in that busy, loud, wide cacophony, also listen to the quiet and disappear while the whole world comes into focus and then watch the world disappear back into you. 
watch as all the voices mute into silence and then have silence give birth to the cacophony of being at that intersection of the dancing figure eight of change. Yes, this time is hard. Yes, we are waiting with bated breath on the edge of a precipice of change so big that it should scare us. And yet, we are also just one small dot in the largeness of time and space, dancing our way to our own place in the great big book of history. It is both and. So be here, be here now, be here for all of it. Listen to the quiet, to the silence, to the speaking of the universe, dancing, grounded and alert here, now, ready. May it be so. And amen. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening, Spirit, speak to me. My ears are wide open, my eyes are now open to see what I may be. I'm listening, I am listening, Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening, I am listening, in this moment of Spirit, silence. speaks to me. I can hear the voices of all my kind I'm listening, singing, I'm listening, the sweet singing, how singing to the wind. My ears are wide open, oh, oh, the joy, my eyes are wide open, oh, oh, oh the love to see and to hear. I for you be and me. Oh, oh, oh. I'm listening in this moment of silence. I am listening. I hear Spirit speak through me. Thank you again for that beautiful music. We're so lucky and so grateful to have such beautiful artistry with us each week. And thank you all so much for your generosity during the offertory just now. As you know, pledges are the core of our church's spiritual practice of generosity. And we're also grateful for additional gifts to support our ministry and thank the folks out there who are appreciating this online ministry and supporting it by texting 73256 with the message give to you you or giving through our website. Your gifts help us continue to provide this ministry. As you know, we also share the plate with an organization each month and in October, Voces de la Frontera is our Share the Plate recipient. Voces serves Southeast Wisconsin's immigrant community and has been doing so since 1998. Voces de la Frontera's mission is to protect and expand civil rights and workers' rights through leadership development, 
community organizing, and empowerment. You can go to their website to give at vdlf.org and click the donate button there. And I just want to encourage a lot of you to go there and donate today, not only because of Vosis's incredible work in Milwaukee and the very serious threats to immigrants right now, but also because we had two unusual Sundays this month, a UU the Vote worship and Kimberly's ordination, um, in which we did not give our have our regular share the plate offering. So I'm just asking you to make an extra effort today to donate to Voces de la Frontera and to give them twice as much as you regularly would so that they receive the support that they need from, from us. I know that we can be generous enough to make up for the strangeness of different services this month. You can see all these options on your screen right now. They'll also live on in the YouTube comments section of this video after worship is over. Thank you again so much for giving right now or when you come back later. Your support keeps us and it keeps our community partners going. Thank you so much. As we prepare to go out into that wide world beyond us this morning, may we remember to listen to all that is inner and outer. May the Spirit speak to us, ground us here and now, and may we be ready. I love you, First Church. May it be so, and amen. We are going Heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Whoa, yeah, yeah. Wo ya ya, 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 wo ya ya.